Um, well, let's get started. Um, welcome, thank you for coming. Uh, I'm kind of surprised and also a bit gratified to see that this many people might be interested in something called base rates and base rate fallacies. I have a couple of goals for the talk, and number one is that you'll be informed and learn something, but maybe more importantly that you will take away some ideas uh, to, to start thinking about ways of collecting data, things that might make sense in your own environments, and and ways to apply what are going to really show to be fairly simple calculations. So uh, you can read the, the name of the talk. Um, I'm Patrick Florer. Uh, this is version, I guess, either 3 or 2.1 of this talk. The first version was done at Siricon last May. Siricon is the Society of Information Risk Analysts. It's uh, very active discussion group that you can find with a search engine. I think over 500 members by now. Uh, people who are interested in all things risk analytic, risk management, uh, qualitative as well as quantitative. Um, here's the layout of the talk. Uh, intro, base rate, fallacy, frequencies, fourfold tables. Really, I'm going to go through three or four different ways of talking about the same thing and how you, how you derive the numbers. Uh, this will involve some arithmetic. There's uh, some stuff for you to try to figure out. And uh, no algebra, just simple multiplication, division, subtraction, addition, and also homework, should you choose. There will be some uh, additional examples at the end of the talk. Uh, if you want to try to work them out, and then when you download the presentation, there are seven or eight slides at the end that kind of work through how, how I, I approach them. So as, uh, maybe I didn't say, my name is Patrick Floor. Uh, there's a little bit about me. I've been around for a while. This is my 10th source conference. The very first Boston in Barcelona. And I've been to the I was invited to speak last year here. I gave this talk along with Jeff Lauder, I don't know if any of you all know Jeff, um, in Seattle last fall. And so this is really a little tweaking on that talk. Jeff is uh, a very thoughtful guy. He writes a blog on Blog InfoSec. He's the president of the Society of Information Risk Analysts, and uh, he couldn't make it today, so we try to carry the, the load. I will on this thing. Or Jeff, I has a much better. I knew when to when to go with things. So, what are base rates? I'm um, just going to throw the question out there. We're going to work it a couple of examples, and uh, and then maybe define it more more formally in a bit. A base rate is essentially a population prevalence. Okay, so what in the world is that? It's so basically how much of something exists in a particular group or sample that you're studying. Uh, my exposure to base rates came from medicine. I worked in evidence-based uh, medicine for about 17 years along with my IT stuff. And so it's the kind of thing that the Center of Disease Controls keep track of, that uh, the doctors keep track of. You know, what's the incidence of prostate cancer in guys over 70 years old? who have you know, other conditions. So without elaborating too much more, here's the first reality check. So imagine the following scenario. There has been a car accident that has gone to trial. We know that a car was impacted by a taxi cab. We furthermore know that in this particular city, there are only two colors of taxi cab, green and orange. We have a witness whose uh, accuracy has been verified somehow or another. Let's just take it as a given that she recollects with 80% accuracy the color of any given taxi cab that she has seen. Okay, so taxi with 80% accuracy. What is the probability this witness will correctly? identify the color of the cab involved in the accident. Okay? 
here are some choices that might come to mind. I'm not going to put anybody on the spot, but uh, okay. I might, I might ask a quick yes. B. Okay. Anybody else want to hazard a guess? Yeah. B. A. D. E. I'm sorry. Was that E or D? Yeah. Okay. Okay. A. Anybody want to go with E? Yeah. Okay. Well, let's let's keep keep moving on. Uh, a few of you have are, are moving in the right direction. Most of you weren't. Let me just say that. <laughs> if it's any consolation, we're going to show you some of Jeff's research in a minute. But also, most physicians who have formally studied epidemiology and should know better get this wrong all the time. So um, you're in good company, and, and after today, I bet you you'll never get it wrong again, and you'll understand why it matters, more importantly. Okay, I'm going to tell you one additional fact, that it turns out in this uh, city that there 85% of the taxis on the road are green and the other 15% are orange. Okay, so now you know something else. You've got a proportion breakdown of the color of the cabs, you know there was an accident, you know that the witness gets the color 80% of the time correctly. Now, same, same five possibilities of answers. Anybody want to change an answer? Okay. Let me, let me break it out a different way. Some people can work this math in their heads a little more easily if I tell you 850 out of every 1,000 cabs are green, 150 are orange. This is called the frequency approach. Rather than trying to manipulate the uh, proportions directly, uh, sometimes it's easier. It's easier for me, or used to be easier for me, to do it this way, okay? So I really didn't tell you any new information. I just gave you a different way of thinking about what 85 and 15 percent mean, okay? Now, same set of questions. Okay? So let me, let me go back to example one. The correct answer after example one was that you did not have enough information to answer the question. All you knew was uh, the witness's reliability rate, if you will, and that there had been an accident. You did not know the base rate of taxis in this particular town. So about taxis. It's going to be about information security in just a minute. I just wanted to give a fairly common example. It turns out that the actual answer is uh, 41%. So this witness, who is 80% accurate, um, given, the f given the base rates of green and orange cabs, um, when you work the math that I'm going to show you how to do and explain, it turns out that her the precise phrase is positive predictive value is only 41%. Now, most people answer the question 80%. Uh, most doctors, when they're quoting you the results of a diagnostic test, are going to ignore the base rate, and they're going to quote you the results of the test. So let me, let me wake everybody up and try to provide a bit of relevance. Um, and we'll see this example in a minute. Let's assume that you are talking to a vendor of a technology. And this vendor has used the phrase false positives. Anybody ever hear a vendor talk about false positive rates in their technology? Okay, well, as soon as you're talking about false positives, now you're talking about base rates, whether you know it or not. You're also talking about true positives, true negatives. I mean, it's just logical. And there must be a negative. So that's really where we're going on this, is to how to determine the predictive value, positive predictive value of any kind of technology that you're evaluating or thinking about in terms of uh, the vendor claims versus reality, okay? So these are the more formal definitions of a base rate and a base rate fallacy. I said a population prevalence. Um, 
there are two words people use interchangeably, maybe not quite accurately, and that's prevalence and incidence. Uh, just to split the hairs, and it does kind of matter. Um, for example, Veracode, whose report I admire a lot, and I'm not saying that because they invited me to their conference, um, measures certain uh, vulnerabilities over a period of time, I believe. Is, isn't there someone here from Veracode that, isn't that what you do? You take like a year's worth of data and you analyze it. So that's an incidence. So a prevalence is if you could go out right now and analyze all the websites, all the applications, whatever you're talking about, or the diseases before they had a chance to change state. You know, because we know that things go from vulnerable to fixed to vulnerable to fixed, for example, when we're talking about uh, InfoSec vulnerabilities. That's a prevalence. You went out, how many people in the United States right now have the flu? That would be a prevalence. When you're talking about a bigger time frame where things could go back and forth and just happen to be the way they are when you get there to measure, that's called an incidence. For the purpose of our discussion, really, it's... It's, it's probably okay to use both, but there is a difference in the terms. So the base rate is how much of it is, how many green and orange taxi cabs, how much malware, how many uh, malicious packets are flowing through your network. Um, there are just a ton of examples I can think of. And then the base rate fallacy is when you draw a conclusion or a probability without taking into account the base rate. The fundamental principle is the lower the base rate, when you're looking at things that are ver relatively rare, uh, the lower the positive predictive value. So just to throw a number out there, because I work with this some, let's say there's a 3% prevalence of something in the world and you believe that. Uh, the, that's going to drive down your positive predictive value no matter how accurate, even if it's 99% on uh, true positive as uh, base rates approach 50%, 60%, this becomes less meaningful. Okay, so Jeff did some research with some GRC folks he knows. He asked 20, it turns out, uh, to do the taxi cab problem. One out of 20 got the answer right. So interesting. Maybe there's an understanding. Here's some uh, example of some base rates that might make a difference. And one of the things you may find yourself saying, in information security, we do not have a heck of a lot of data about base rates. Um, very few people, Veracode being one, White Hat Security and some others, the people who maintain these kind of databases of different things, they're the ones in a position to have a big enough sample to start talking about what the base rates of things are. So one of the things I'm interested in, for, for example, is what is the base rate of malware on a typical corporate network? And I've, I've done some research and I've tried to find some numbers and let's, let me qualify it a little better because definition really matters. It's all in your definition of your population, of your sample. So I'm gonna define malware as uh, EXEs or DLLs that have a malicious purpose to them. Yes? How do you define network? How what? How do you define typical enterprise network? I don't know. Number servers? Uh, those are all good questions, and those are things you need to be clear about because what it, what it turns out is most people's numbers really aren't directly comparable. So I'll throw some things out that I've read. For example, I've seen estimates referred to, it to from an unnamed Gartner report, which just drives me crazy. If any of you people are involved in writing reports and you cite a source as authoritative, I think you should give a footnote, you know, just to, just to say what it was. So three, three to eight percent, one number I heard. I saw another number, four percent, um, another not directly comparable number. I think you all know that Microsoft, which is an, uh, it's called the uh, Threat Incidents Report, I think. They put every month, it's the result of their malicious scanning tools, so that's not exactly, you know, malware is what they're looking for, but their incidences are down and their prevalence is down in the 1% rate. And then somebody published a report the other day, one of the big, uh, you know, global antivirus people, I forget who it was, said that they encountered malware on 32% of every computer they scanned. 
I just, you know, I found that totally unbelievable that, you know, there it is. So all of these things, I mean, for the purpose of analyzing risk, for the purpose of allocating spend on different technologies, it would be really helpful to have some idea of base rates. Um, I would imagine you all can think of different things here. Here's some, some reasons. I think many of us have complained, you know, with the CVSS scoring system and vulnerability scoring that the, the methodizing what matters is a little bit deficient. Um, makes it kind of hard. You know, the picture a lot of business people have of information security is that we're all just screaming our heads off everything and we can't really do rational prioritization of the things that matter most. So I think base rates could certainly help in that. Okay, so natural frequencies, this is just another way of working out the problem. It was the third set of solutions here, and I'm going to kind of skip through this. Uh, Gerd Geisenrenzer, this is someone that Jeff is very fond of. I've never read any of his stuff. He's, uh, I think he's a German uh, decision analysis scientist. Um, but we do need to talk about four things that I'm going to elaborate in the next section. I've, I talked about them briefly. Everybody deals with false positives. And, and as I said, that gives rise to four other numbers that have to come to play in that discussion. If, if, if I tell you my technology throws off about 10% false positives, then I am making implicit statements about base rate, about the true positives, about the false negatives, and the true negatives. So what, what are all those things? Well, I think maybe when I get my fourfold table up here, uh, we go through this about every way to Sunday in this, in this presentation. So I want to um, get to this and then expand on it. This is a, four by, a fourfold table, a two-by matrix. There are a lot of different ways to talk about this. You have basically two sets of practically anything you like, uh, true, false, and true, false, positive, negative, true, false, whatever, okay? I'm, I'm going to really get into this now. Um, basically, two sets of dichotomous outcomes. That's not too hard to, to grok. Um, just another way of saying it. So let me, let me define the terms a little more closely exists or is true, doesn't exist, isn't true, exists or true, you detect it correctly, you detect it wrongly. There are a lot of different ways to define your rows and columns. Whatever it is, virus, worm, disease, it could be something on the positive side. Um, so, sorry, I didn't mean to go by that one, that was the one I wanted. So what's a true positive? A true positive is Let's, let's talk about malware. So a true positive would be, yes, it's malware, and yes, we detected it correctly. A false positive would mean, no, it's not malware, but we said it was. Okay? A true negative would be, no, it's not malware, and we said it wasn't malware. We got it right. And then a false negative is the one that's really troublesome, Yes, it was malware, but our scanner said it wasn't. So if you make the analogy just in disease, you know, you get a false negative. You, just, you thought you had cancer. The test said, no, you're clear, and you find out three years later that the test was So false positives are the things that create all the busy work for people, you know, because you can't distinguish a false positive from a true positive. And it's labor intensive and costly, and it, it's annoying. Uh, false negatives are the things that are actually very, very dangerous. It's like you had a rattlesnake in your dressing drawer, and you thought it was a garter snake. Okay? Little Texan analogy, I guess. Okay, so let's let's do an example based on a fourfold table. Um, I'm a vendor, you're a CISO, you're a director of security, whatever. I just walked in and said, hey, I've got this stuff that you really need to buy. It will detect malware with a 95% true positive or accuracy rate. And I can have you talk, you know, and I show you my numbers. You know, it, it's going to find some false positive, positives, maybe 10%. Okay? 
So the question is, what's the probability that anything you're looking at on that list of positives really is a true positive, or in more formal terms, what's the positive predictive value of that set of statements? And can you even calculate a positive predictive value yet? So question for the group, can you, can you get to where you need to go with these two numbers? What do you still need? You need a base rate, that's right. So let's just assume that the base rate was uh, 3%, just for sake of discussion. Okay? Now we have the numbers we need to build the table. Yes? Sorry, can you define base rate once again in comparison to my maternal net worth? Well, you know, it's 3% of whatever population we, we defined as we chose to define it. So. I'm going to define it for sake of this example is I have 30,000 nodes and 1,000 servers in my network. That's getting pretty, is that specific enough, Andrew? And uh, we believe based on however we came to this belief that about 3% of those DLLs and EXEs at any given time are malicious. Okay? All right. So how do we work this out? Um, let's take an example. Let's say there are a million files in that, in, in that uh, scenario I just described, which actually would be really very, very low for something that size. Probably got a million files on my own PC, and most of you guys probably do too as well. So the first thing you want to do is break it out between what's malware and what's not. So we said 3% was malware is our estimate. So that would be roughly 30,000 of those million files are actually malware, whether we can detect them correctly or not. And at 970,000 or not. With me so far? Of the 30,000 malicious files, we can correctly identify 95%. That's what our technology vendor just told us. Those are the true positives. Yes, it's malware, and yes, the technology or the scanner said it was malware, true positive. However, 5% were missed, so those are the false negatives. Yes, it was malware, but uh, didn't see it as such. We told you it was okay. That never happens, does it? <laughs> I thought it might. Okay. So we've got two of our numbers now. We've got the 28,500. Whoops, I'm going too fast. Okay. And we've got 1,500. So we've accounted for the 30,000. I'm going through this kind of meticulously because it's an easy calculation. It's something I think is hugely important that Gene Kim said this morning. If you haven't read the Phoenix Project, if you haven't studied theory of constraints, it would probably be, it might be worth your while to do it, but one of the things I think we have to do, I, I try to do it, we have to practice. You know, there was a time when I didn't know this stuff, and the primary reason I do know it now is because I've practiced it. I've built spreadsheets, I've used it, I've practiced it, you know, and if you find an application for this way of thinking in your day-to-day -day work, just practice it and then, then you'll know how to do it. Um, okay, so now we... Most speakers get a percentage point every time we mention Gene King's book. Oh, sorry. <laughs> then how do, I, how do I take it away? Because I was serious in my comment. If all this stuff is so great at Toyota, why are they recalling more cars for quality problems than any other manufacturer in automotive history? Maybe 3,300 stops quality checks a day is too many. Yeah, right. Well, yeah. <laughs> okay, so now we need to deal with the, the non-malicious files in our set of assumptions. And remember, this is a set of estimates. There are very few perfect numbers going to be had in information security, IT, or any place else. Okay, so if we had 970,000 files that we expected to be non-malicious in a 10% false positive rate, that would be about 97,000 files that would be classified as false positives. Ouch. Now, by the way, I just gave you a printout this high 
of all the, all the positives out of this scanning technology. And so you can spend the next three months going through this because you remember that 95% accuracy rate? Well, maybe not quite yet. Okay, and then of course, if 10% are incorrectly identified as malware or false positive, that means the other 90% are correctly identified, right? So that would be 873,000, 90% of 970,000. This is why you need a structure, uh, a simple structure like a fourfold table because it will keep you honest. So now we can plug in the numbers into the fourfold table. And what you can see about the columns, true and false, the numbers in the true col column are those malware samples that really are malware, regardless whether they were correctly detected or not. The numbers in the false column were the ones that really weren't malware, again, regardless if they were detected as being malware or not. And then reading across the table, you can make a, an equivalent set of statements. Now, a couple things to note here. These four numbers add up to your base rate. So this is a frequency approach. If you, if you uh, do the math or if you were following along, you'll see that those four numbers add up to a million. And if they, if they don't add up to where you started, then you messed up, okay? Once you have these numbers, now you can start calculating things. Um, what's the probability that a file really is malware? Or again, the PPV, the positive predictive value. And you take those files that really are malware and were detected as such, the true positives, and you divide that number by everything that was detected as positive, regardless of whether it was or not. And you find out that the positive predictive value of my great technology is not 95%, it's 22 and a half. Which means that of that list of 100,000 positives that you just got out of my technology, something like 80% of them are bogus. Does that feel good? <laughs> okay. Um, there's also something called a negative predictive value, and that is, that has to do, and, and these things, they, they don't, they relate but not directly. The negative predictive value is how good is the technology at detecting stuff that isn't malware. And generally speaking, uh, when you do these kind of calculations, you find out that the negative predictive value is a whole lot higher. This one is close to 100%. Because you have such a small number of false negatives, I mean, uh, true negatives, uh, and you have a very, very large number of true, excuse me, yeah, you have a very small number of false negatives but a very, very large number of true negatives. So. I mean, if you download the presentation, and this, this really works, it's not that hard. Questions, comments? Irrelevant, you all just being nice to me. Yes? Was your map right on the last slide? I think so. Well, if you look at TN, it's lined out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Oh, you know what? I take it back. You're right. It should be 873,000. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And I'll fix that and send an amended. All these numbers used to be different. So thanks for, your, thanks for being awake. So uh, here's some things I told you. The numbers need to add up. Yes. going to talk about that in a minute. I mean, it's, uh, it's not easy. You know, it gets into a subject dear to the heart of some of the people in this room called metrics. Um, and if you're not aware of uh, some of the groups, there's a mailing list called securitymetrics.org. There's an annual conference that's part of RSA called Metricon. And Andrew, Andrew Jackwith, who was here just before me, was, you know, one of the important people in that space, uh, as are some other people in this room. And the fact is, we don't have a lot of good metrics in information security. So, you know, I, I'm a proponent of believing if you start with a question like you just did, then you have some prayer of finding an answer. If you, if you don't start with a good question or a need, then you're just kind of wasting your time. So that's one of my challenges to everybody in here, including me, is you know, what do you wish you knew 
in your environment? What would be relevant towards your operations if you knew? What would you need to collect? And how can you start collecting that? And when can you start? Everybody complains, you know, we don't have enough data. Well, we, we have a lot of different kinds of data. Uh, but the issue on these kinds of data is if you want any kind of historical baseline for a year or two, it's going to be a year or two from now if you start today. If you don't start till next week, it's going to be a year or two from next week. If you don't start till next year, it's going to be a year or two from next year. So that's just the nature of reality. There's nothing we can do about that. I don't have a magic answer for you. You know, for example, my numbers on malware. I, I spent a couple of days researching Google. I tried to find every report I could. I posed the question to the CIRA mailing list and security metrics mailing list. How are we doing on time? Okay. Um, this is one of the big challenges. You know, what are the metrics that matter? Everybody talks about metrics, you know, and we tend to come up, get on a soapbox for a sec, we tend to talk about providing numbers that we can measure easily that really have no operational, financial, or any other kind of relevance. You know, how many days did we go between firewall crashes? whoop de doo That's something we can measure, you know. Um, anyhow, I'll, I'm going to leave that one for you guys to work out. You're probably much better than I am. Okay. Yeah, did you catch my... You, Okay, 8745 should be 873. The answer to this equation is 100%. <laughs> Ninety-nine point eight percent is the result of dividing 873. Okay, now anybody in this room ever heard of Bayes' theorem? Yeah, well there it is in all its glory. Seems like uh, there's not much to it for everything that's been talked about and read about. So Bayes' theorem is a way you can take these numbers on false positives, base rates, and uh, true positives and come up with exactly the same answer. Okay. Um, essentially what this says is what's the probability that something is malware given a positive test? So it's a little backwards of the way we typically do probability. Um, normally we'd say, what's the probability that my test will tell me accurately that it's malware? And so Bayes' theorem turns that around and says, what's the probability if I know that it's malware that my test was correct? Okay. And I've tried to break this down in an easy way. It's essentially it says the answer to that question is, uh, the probability that my test can determine that it's malware, that was the 95%, times the base rate, which is the probability of A, the probability in the population, divided by the probability of a positive detection, whether it's true or false. That's maybe the simplest way to translate that in this context. So we take our numbers, if you'll recall, we didn't actually have a probability of a positive detection, so I had to work that out. But this is all in the, in the thing. It's basically, um, sometimes it burns my head at this time of the afternoon even to look at these numbers. I can't imagine what it's like for you guys seeing it for the first time. Um, you take your true positive rate times the uh, incidence or prevalence. So that was 0.95 times 0.03. And then you take 1 minus the prevalence, which is the 0.97, which is the number of uh, falses in your population. It's 97% not malicious. Multiply that by the false positive rate. You come out with this number, 12.5%. And you plug those numbers in, and so you, so you get the same 22.7%. Um, you know, it's easy to set this up in a spreadsheet. In fact, I'll show you uh, some things, and I, I'll be happy to share this spreadsheet, uh, at least part of it. Part of it uses some software you probably don't have and I can't give to you. Um, 
Okay, before we go there, just to reiterate, there is a difference between prevalence and incidence. It's mainly uh, an issue of time frame. If you compress your time frame down to right now, prevalence and incidence mean the same thing. If you expand your time frame out over months or a year, prevalence and incidence don't mean the same thing. Same sort of thing, but not exactly the same thing. Okay, we'll come to homework in a minute. Um, let me see where my, um, oh, I guess it's not there. I must have shut it down. So it's pretty easy to construct a simple spreadsheet. I thought I had it loaded. I apologize. So uh, Veracode just published a new state of software report in the last week or 10 days. And I went and grabbed some numbers SQL for SQL injection. Okay, so I basically said 32% uh, is what they quote overall. And if some of the Veracode people correct me if I got that wrong, but I think that's the right number. Uh, my technology is 95% and 10%. So my base rate's 32%. So Veracode is actually an example, and White Hat knows this too from their data analysis. They have a base rate not only on SQL injection overall, but they break it down on programming language. And, and what you'll see is the rate varies enormously. As I recollect from like 3% for Java all the way up to over 70% for Cold Fusion. So maybe that tells you something right there. So anyway, I built this little spreadsheet and you just plug the numbers in. And so given those numbers, given a given a 32% incidence of SQL injection and a 10% false positive rate and a 95% detection rate, it turns out that the positive predictive value is pretty good. It's about 82%. And as I told you, you know, as the base rate approaches 50%, the positive predictive value starts going way up. Now, this I'd be glad to share with anybody who's interested. I just want to show you this other one. Um, the reason I can't share this is it uses a proprietary quantitative risk analysis uh, program called Model Risk from a fellow named David Vose. And if you're interested in quantitative risk analysis, uh, Vose is one of the true wizards. So this is a Monte Carlo simulation that instead of relying on a point estimate of 32% creates a range. It says, you know, the lowest number I've seen on prevalence for SQL injection, again using the Veracode report, was 3%. The highest number I saw was 72%. And the most likely, or the overall average, was 32%. I further qualified. I said, you know, no technology is dead on on a percentage accuracy. So I said between 90 to 95% to 98%, and on the false positive rate, 10 to 15 to 18. Now, these are not anybody's numbers, the, the, the uh, base rates are from Veracode, the rest I just made up. So, um, no, uh -uh, you have to do your own most likely. It will produce a curve that you can then measure a most likely off of. Uh, Vose has some pretty interesting things to say about using mode for anything. Do you have the book? The 15-pound boat anchor? No, I just, well, right. So here's, here's how that all works, really. So uh, you can read about Monte Carlo simulation um, on Wikipedia. Um, you can go to my website and read about it. You can fool around with a calculator. Um, so essentially, given those sets of inputs, these were the outputs. That's a histogram. And basically, uh, what we see is that the positive predictive value, giving those sets of inputs, is it's negatively skewed in a technical term, but it's really you know quite high. Uh, and then. You know, I, the spreadsheet, go away, this thing. Here we go. Sorry, I'm challenged. Okay, so these are the ranges that the Monte Carlo simulation came up with for 
positive predictive value and negative predictive value. So this is maybe a little more sophisticated way to build some uncertainty into what you're thinking about your base rate. It's also a way of uh, discounting the veracity of statements made by your vendor. No offense to any vendors in here, but uh, everybody believes his or her stuff really works great. Otherwise, they wouldn't be selling it. And uh, so that's just that's the way I kind of do base rates since I've, I've got this software and I'm kind of used to doing things this way. Uh, so now we come to homework. Thank you for staying with me this long. Uh, I owe this example to Mr. Schneier. Um, maybe unfortunately relevant given what happened in this town yesterday. Um, as you can see, the, the government wants a fancy and expensive surveillance system because there are a thousand terrorists living in the United States and this system is amazing. It will correctly identify 99% of them and the false positive rate is one-tenth of one percent. Okay? Who could say no to that? So what's the positive predictive value of this thing? Without working it out, let's just, I'll give you a choice of two answers. It's very high or it's so low you pr practically can't see it. What do you think? Low? High? Okay. That's interesting. Well, the answers are further down the slide deck. Okay, so that's, um, that's one if you want to pick up this slide deck and work that out to kind of get this down, uh, please do. And if you don't want to do that, you won't hurt my feelings. Uh, here's uh, maybe a little more relevant to information security. Also, surveillance cameras okay, um, could be relevant to information security just on your campus or in your building or whatever. Uh, people seem to love those things. Um, I'm not a big fan. So this is a technology example similar to the one I worked out. And uh, I just, you know, I made up for you the, the base rates and all that stuff. And uh, we went through the examples in a blurb about me and Jeff. And uh, there you are. I think the thing I'd like to leave with you is any time you find yourself talking about false positives. You're really talking about all these things I presented today. Whether you're before today or not, uh, you are. Um, it's pretty interesting. I'll just cite an example since we have a minute. I've kind of looked at some learning approaches to the detection of malware, uh, specifically a, a company called Dambala because they've published about 20 academic research papers, and it's, what's interesting to me, they get these amazing, amazingly accurate rates on false positives and true positives, but the other thing they do when they seed their test samples is they put in about 70% samples of known malware and 30% samples of known not malware, so by virtue of the fact that they're putting in so much stuff that's already known to be malware, you could flip a coin. That's one way to think about as a base rate approaches and exceeds 50%, you might as well just flip a coin to decide what's, what's good and what's bad because that's just as accurate. So, okay, I'll stop there. Thank you, everyone. Any questions or comments? Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to ask my question in the form of sort of medicine doing which is like, you know, in a way we kind of know what the base rate of cancer is because eventually cancer proves itself, you know, some years down the road or something like that. We, we have some notions of... Well, we have a biological model for the different types of cancers that is reasonably accurate in some cases. Okay. <laughs> I noticed I, I didn't say most. Yeah. Right. In the info tech world, right? You bring, bring on the question of the malware, our ability to detect malware, uh, you know, sometimes which intentionally tries to hide itself is, is hidden. So it seems to me, absent your confirmation or whatever, it seems to me that one of our big challenges may be being able to even have reasonable guesses as to what our base rates are. I 
agree. I, I agree. That's why I think an uncertainty-based, Monte Carlo-based, not to tout what I do, but there's a reason to do what I do. And I believe what I believe. You know, we get hung up on a single number or trying to find a perfect answer rather than to find some approximation, which I think if you talk to any scientist, and I am not a scientist, I'm not a statistician, but I'm a fairly knowledgeable guy interested in a lot of things, I think, you know, they will tell you you've got to start somewhere. Got to make an approximation. Maybe your error bars are this big, okay? But you just keep working at it, and I guess that's the message I really want to get across is I'm old. I don't know how much longer I'm going to be doing this, but I only see a couple of people in here I think are as old as me. And I see some young people, and I mean, I think these kinds of things are necessary. And Steve, you're, you're, you're saying they're necessary. You know, there's some things where we would really be better. How do we start capturing? What kind of, I'm not even talking about, uh, you know, randomized control trials or you know, experiments like they do in medicine, but we need to start thinking along these terms. Because there's, there are, you know, other people have been down similar paths at some point in the So I wish I had a magic bullet, but I don't, and I just ran out of time. So can we do one more question, Heather, if there is? Yes. Oh, did, did I need a release? I hope not. No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I want to talk to you about your uh, your p values because they just don't make any sense to me. <laughs> and I tried, I tried, I, I read that section ten times and still couldn't quite get where you're going. That's why we hire hired, um, a statistician to do that. Did Betsy Nichols do that stuff for you? Okay. I can forward your questions to Betsy, but okay.